Hello and welcome to TVBF Online. Today we begin a new series of looking at how to live a godly life by looking at ancient wisdom. And the ancient wisdom we're looking at is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to be looking at chapters 7 through to 11 for the next few weeks. This is all about how we believe, how we belong and how we behave. Paul writes these words to people in a pagan society. Today we live in a post-Christian society where a lot of the people around us don't really understand what Christianity is all about. So they have a very loose understanding about not only believing but belonging and behaving in the Christian faith. So while Paul writes to the 1 Corinthians um, about issues that seem totally irrelevant to us, you suddenly realise how relevant they are because he talks about building up a community in love he talks about sexual behavior he talks about dressing appropriately he talks about behavior in public worship and what we need to understand are the principles he works through and what is transferable into our culture today so in 1 corinthians chapter 8 is what we're going to read from this morning he's talking about the principle of love and how when we put this principle of love at the very centre of everything we do, then we're learning how to belong and we're learning how to, be, how to behave as a result of the beliefs we have in following Jesus Christ. So from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 we read these words. Now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge and knowledge puffs up but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live but not everyone knows this some people are still so accustomed to idols that they eat uh, such food and think of it as being having been sacrificed to an idol and since their conscience is weak it is defiled but food does not bring us near to God we are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if, any, if, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Okay, just before we go any further, let's just stop and pray together. Father God, as we look at your word, encourage us to... Uh, breathe deeply this morning, gather our scattered thoughts and our senses and focus on your presence with us this day. And would you please unleash your Holy Spirit upon us? OK, let's look at the book. The theme I've got today is living with a clear conscience. So how do we actually begin to think about that? Richard Baxter was a 17th century church leader and he said in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in all things love. Which is a pretty good summary of what the Apostle Paul was talking about here in 1 Corinthians 8. You know, it's easy to have an, a, 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 a holier than thou attitude and for that to creep upon us unawares and for us to be taken by surprise sometimes and when we hold strongly uh, held principles they can easily lead us to condemn the behavior of others who are following Christ as well 
This is for people who believe in who Christ is, who belong to him and who want to behave well in the way they live. And sometimes our own principles can get in the way of stopping those who belong to Christ behaving in a way that fulfills their belief in how Christ wants them to live. And sometimes we can hold our principles in a way that they become a matter of selfish pride rather than love for others, as Paul points out in verse 1 of chapter 8. And I want to say something that I'm going to keep on repeating again and again as I speak to you this morning. And it's very simply this. When God measures a person's growth in discipleship, he puts the tape measure round the heart and not around the head which is what the apostle paul does here in 1 corinthians 8 so how do we live a distinctive lifestyle while still remaining concerned about the welfare of others well three very simple suggestions to put to you to think about that for a moment the first thing is this live with your judgments in full view of everybody else because knowledge puffs up but love deflates. When we criticise someone else's religious devotion to God, we sit in judgment over them. So our language of theological learning is only one factor we need to take into account when we're making a judgment. Here in Corinth, it was about eating meat which had been sacrificed to idols. Now, Corinth was a place where people knew their rights. They, it was a culture where everyone knew their rights. The well-to-do and the knowledgeable knew their rights and insisted upon them. This led to a confusion between rights and freedom. And Paul was concerned about the use of personal rights, irrespective of the impact upon others. Paul's main argument is that our own rights are not for our own benefit, but always for the benefit of others. Knowledge must be essential, but it is not sufficient when making a decision. And if you think this is irrelevant to us today, then consider the, the newsreels you saw the other week, where, in a very practical way, people said, well, I have the right, now that lockdown is being, res is being rescinded, to go to the beach. So half a million people descend on a beach. Was that exercising their rights? And was that beneficial to everybody else? The Apostle Paul would say, you have your rights, but think about everybody else. So the issue is a live one in 21st century Britain today and not just in 1st century uh, Corinth. Paul puts it, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Paul is challenging the idea of spiritual pride here. In the 11th century, there was a massive split in the church between East and West, between Eastern Orthodox and Western Orthodox. And there was a growing sense of unease about why this had actually happened. And it resulted in a complete breakdown of uh, in, in differences due to culture, identity, theology and power plays. And it's still going on today. And some of the reasons for the breakdown were absolutely amazing. For example, one was whether, whether the bread at communion was leavened or unleavened. Another reason for the breakdown was over hairstyles. Not quite like mine, but whether it was shaved heads, well, I suppose more like mine, uh, over beards and long hair. That was some of the reasons why this split actually came about. In 1966, the 20th century church leader John Stott wrote these words. The visible unity of the church must allow for divergences of belief and practice in matters of secondary importance. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, Paul writes this, Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul has a principle here which he operates upon. And before we start to judge others, God is more concerned about the love in our hearts towards one another than the knowledge in our heads. 
So again, my mantra is this. When God looks to measure our growth in discipleship, he puts the tape around our hearts and not around our heads. The greatest rights and freedom we have been given by God is the freedom to love. That's the first thing. The second thing is love with, love with God's love and keep that love in view because that builds up the body of Christ. 21st century church leader Oliver O'Donovan uh, puts it like, like this. Love is not a principle on which we may act. It's not one principle among others. It is not the most important principle. It is not even the sole principle. It is the architectonic principle, the structure of all principles, unifying the moral law and giving it coherence. So the priority of love applies not just to our attitudes and our thoughts, but to our actions as well. We may well have reached in our theological knowledge and understanding on something. But that does not necessarily mean that we need to follow it through. Our freedom needs to be exercised lovingly. So that, as Paul says in verse 8, we do not cause a stumbling block to the weak. In Galatians 5 and verse 13, Paul writes about serving one another humbly in love. That literally means to be a slave to somebody else. And love is the all-embracing context of what he is saying. It is doing away with the two strong Western views that hold our hearts together. One is the individual and the other is the right to choose. And it's not about meeting our own autonomous desires. And it is, it's nothing to do with the opportunity of endless choice. Paul says it is God's love which impacts our individualism and impacts our freedom of choice. Paul is saying that there is no free for all here. Paul is looking for the heart motivation behind it. If we are motivated by the love of God and to glorify God, there will be a, there will be a thinking about not what benefits us, but what is beneficial to others as well. So Paul writes in eight, chapter 8 and verse 13 here, Therefore, if I eat, if I eat, if, if what I eat causes my brothers to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. So I will not cause him to fall. So Paul is not advocating a line, uh, uh, an, an, a, a live and let live sort of attitude. But whether we are living for God and being guided by God, that's the principle. And remember again, this is that when God wants to measure the growth of your discipleship and my discipleship, he puts the tape around my heart and your heart and not around my head or your head. That's what Paul is always saying. That's, what the, that's the, the nail he is driving home here, the principle of love he is driving home here. And the last thing I want to say to you is this. Live with a clear conscience before God, because love clarifies all things. And some things are clear and crucial. Doctrinal and ethical matters, they are important. They are not open for negotiation. But here Paul is addressing disputable things. In the film The Apostle, there is a scene where Sonny, the, uh, uh, the Pentecostal pr uh, preacher, watches a Catholic priest blessing a fishing boat. Uh, and he's using holy water, he's all rolled up, he's attended by acolytes and crucifers, and he's doing the whole business, the whole ten yards. And St Sonny stands back and he's amazed at what he says. But then he says approvingly, he says this, You do it your way and we do it mine. But in the end, we get it done, don't we? And that's the important principle. You live with a clear conscience because love clarifies everything and God's love makes everything crystal, crystal clear. In Romans 14 and 15, Paul writes, uh, d uh, not about food, but about days. He says, one person esteems one day better than another. 
while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Two of the great church leaders or evangelicals and charismatics, yeah, I would say, of the 19th century church. One was D.L. Moody and the other was C.H. Spurgeon. And when Moody first came uh, to England, he's paid Spurgeon a visit. And Spurgeon opened the door and he was smoking what he normally smoked with a big fat cigar. Moody stood back and looked absolutely astounded and shocked. And he said, how can you, a man of God, smoke a cigar? And Spurgeon just puffed again on his cigar. He didn't take an offence, but simply pointed to Moody's rather round belly and asked him, how can you, a man of God, be so fat? The fact is, they disagreed on the minor issues of smoking and diet. Moody stayed fat and Spurgeon kept on smoking. And they became the best of friends. Now today, knowing what we know about smoking and knowing what we know about weight gain, then both of them might have been better off considering what they were doing for their health and for the welfare and well-being of their bodies. But Paul here in 1 Corinthians 8 urges us to recognise that love builds up community. Knowledge puffs up, but when knowledge becomes the benchmark over love, we hurt others. When rights and liberty and freedom become the benchmark over love, we sin against Jesus himself. Because Paul said, when you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Jesus or you sin against Christ. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 12. So as we live with a conscience before God, we need at times to exercise the same self-discipline as Paul did here, as he wanted these Corinthians to do. And he wants us to learn and he wants us to understand that when God measures our growth in discipleship and in Christ-likeness, he puts the tape around our hearts and not around our head. Repeat after me. When God wants to measure our growth in Christ likeness, he puts the tape around our heart and not around our head. And I think that's a pretty good way to live a godly lifestyle today. Now, what do you think? Let's pray. Father, would you encourage us this day to live a lifestyle that's based on your wisdom and on your insights? And encourage us as we grow and develop to keep looking to you, to keep our eyes fixed upon you, so that our behaviour is one that models our belief in you. And so as we belong to one another, we learn how to love one another better. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.